Well, hello and welcome to the 27th Degree with Chris and Nancy. So today we have episode number 54, Medical Education with Dr. Charles Posner. And today we'll be discussing medical education. Before we begin our conversation, however, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Bay Coast Bank. Bay Coast Bank is just right for all of your financial needs. Visit baycoast.bank or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. As always, you can support the 27th Degree with Chris and Nancy by signing up as a patron. Go to patron.podbean.com slash the 27th Degree, or you can click on the link on our Facebook page. $5 a month gets you a shout out, exclusive content, and sneak peeks for upcoming shows. You can find the 27th Degree across social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe to the 27 Degrees Consulting channel on YouTube. So I'm going to start with uh, just reading a little bit uh, about Dr. Posner here. He has quite the uh, uh, resume. So thank you my, so my much. My mother wrote it. Did she? Okay. <laughs> it looks like something a mother would write. It's had a lot of good stuff in here. So, But thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. So Dr. Posner graduated from Tufts Medical School and completed an internal medicine residency at Beth Israel Hospital slash Harvard Medical School and an emergency medicine residency at UCLA. Prior to attending medical school, he was a firefighter paramedic. He helped found the Department of Emergency Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He was the director of S simulation-based education at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he created the Stratus Center for Medical Stimula Stimulation. Simulation. We were stimulated. <laughs> Um, an, intention, an internationally renowned educational center. He has developed educational centers in India, China, uh, Kazakhstan, and Argentina. Dr. Posner was honored by the International Society of Simulation in Healthcare as an inaugural fellow of the society. He is also the recipient of the Bernard Lown Award for Education at Harvard Medical School. He authored numerous papers and contributed to many textbooks. He's an invited speaker both nationally and internationally. His clinical interest is medical resuscitation. He retired from active practice in 2021 as an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. It's quite a background. You know, yeah, I can't believe bit. it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom does an awesome job writing it. Don't tell her that. <laughs> no, that's great, though. So we're really pleased to have you here. Thanks Very for excited. having me, Chris. Yeah, no, nice. Thank you. Thank you for, for participating. So why don't we talk a little bit about, um, I guess we'll start with medical simulation. Sure. Let's why don't, why don't we? Uh, most people don't know about medical right. simulation. Right. That's why I thought we'd start with that and we can explain what it is. And Medical simulation the is that we everybody describes it a little bit differently. But the, the definition that I use that I think really sums it up is it's the use of a device or series of devices mm -hmm. to emulate a real patient care situation for training, research, or process improvement. Okay. Uh, it's... It, it's Roots really come from, you know, many years ago. They've been doing simulation for thousands of years, believe it or not. But it's real modern roots come from CPR okay. and Recessa Annie. So Recessa Annie was the first real sort of modern simulator. But yeah. since then, Recessa Annie has, you know, grown. Mm -hmm. It is now Recessa Annie on steroids. <laughs> and now they have, they have simulators that not only are full body simulators, can emulate the entire pit you know, physiology of a patient, but we also have skills trainers and we also have uh, virtual reality trainers where you can actually use real instruments or the, the handles of real instruments to do uh, digital uh, simulation because every, oh, anything cool. you can do on a TV, you know, like laparoscopic surgery right. or endoscop endoscopy can be done on a simulator. And the whole idea is that we cannot practice on patients the first time we do it. Mm -hmm. We should practice before so that we can then be have some confidence and some, you know, uh, competence before we get to the patient. So right. it's safer for patients. It's better for the, the, the learner because it's easier to learn in a non-patient care situation. Right. But then go and do patient care because we'll never take away the patient care. That's great. I mean, there's always this, this joke that we in the medical field have that you don't go to a teaching hospital July 1st when the new interns are there. <laughs> but, well, it, it, keep, you know, it keeps the attendings on the right. rise. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's, but it's true. I mean, I just think back to um, how things have changed since I've gone back to UMass and, you know, for reunions and whatnot. Um, so I graduated from medical school in 1993, residency in 97. And, um, you know, we didn't really have simulated training right. per se at that time. So, you know, you, the, it was 
the typical medical education that, you know, we all went through back then, the first two years were mostly book learning and, you know, you did some dissections of a cadaver. And then oh. the second two years you were on the wards and, you know, were taught by, you know, an, uh, a senior staff member, whether it be an attending or a resident or whatever it may be. And that's how you learned. And it was the see one, do one, teach one. Exactly. And that was, that was what was always said. See one, do one, teach one. And, and <laughs> if, you, if you step back and think about that. Right. That's crazy. It is crazy. Mm -hmm. That is that, you know, we don't have simulation for everything. And, right. and clearly, you know, we're still developing, you know, more ways to uh, simulate things. But it's crazy to think that one can learn that way. And, and the other thing is that that's the way bad practice is perpetuated. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. And, and, and what we need to do is we need to sort of make sure that what we're teaching people is right. the right way to teach mm -hmm. and then be able to repeat that and reproduce that. Right. Simulation can also be used for assessment. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more and more assessment being done using simulation. And it's a controversial sort of subject within simulation. But I personally think it's a, it's a legitimate way to assess uh, mm. a clinician for competence. How do we assess people now in medicine? Well, I was, a, I was a, an attending in an emergency department, and I said, oh, I saw these residents doing this and that and the other thing. Well, I'll be honest with you. I was seeing a lot of patients running around the emergency department and hoping the resident was not mm -hmm. hurting a patient. Now, I tried to see the, the residents do as much as I possibly sure, could. Sure, of course. But it was not reproducible. It was not predictable. Right. And it was very difficult to really do a competency assessment in that environment. If you come to the simulation lab, and it is not real, we never say that we're making it a real situation. But if we can make it as real as possible, we can reproduce it and we can compare apples to apples. Right. So when one person comes in and they do a simulated case and another person comes in and does the same simulated case, now we can start comparing things and measure competence. Well, there's some standardization right. there. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, and, that's, and it's the same yeah. standard. Like if you mm -hmm. learn from two or three different people, everyone has their own way of doing things. Absolutely. And it, you know, because they've drifted maybe a little bit from the policy or the procedure. And, and uh, an example of that is when I came to the Brigham and started the simulation program, we were asked to, you know, we had a problem. The problem mm. was, you know, infections right. with cent central lines. That was, a, that was, and, and it, it was, a pr it had been a problem for many years, mm. but it became a real problem for the hospitals when CMS said, you made made the infection. You pay for it. Yeah, right. remember that was a few years back, and that was a, that was probably now fifteen or twenty or fifteen years back. Yeah. I would say, and so what we what we did is we said, well, we've got to do something about that. You know, so what? How do you do that? Well, there are things you can do at the bedside, but there are also things you can do educationally. Right, and so we developed a program of teaching people before they got to the bedside how to do a central line. Mm -hmm. Under ultrasound guidance and with with a simulator, again, it's not a real situation, but you get the muscle memory and you can get the ability to learn the steps before you're up there with the patient near Big Red. You know, and you can do it multiple times and it's a safe environment and you're not afraid to ask all sorts of questions. I mean, you're not going to ask questions in front of a patient. You're going to be like, oh. And, 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 you know, it, it's, it, it is a safe environment and you're there to learn, right? you know, and as opposed to, you know, it, it's the, 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 the analogy I use is a golfer doesn't start out the U.S. Open. Right. Mm -hmm. A golfer, you know, starts out by practicing and we start out at the U.S. Open every time. Right. You know, because we, we can't make mistakes. The right. expectation is we won't make mistakes. And mm -hmm. Clearly we do. But I want to get back to the story about the uh, central line. You know, when we looked at how people were doing central lines at our hospital, they did them differently in the, C uh, the cardiothoracic uh, intensive care unit. They did it differently in the MICU. They did it differently in the ICU. They even had different uh, equipment yeah. depending on what the situation right. was. So we, we basically got everyone together and said, this is how we need to do it. Right. And we were able to standardize the process and then teach the process. And there's good data that showed that people that got trained using simulation as a means of, uh, you know, starting central lines mm. not only had better outcomes in terms of infection, but it was cheaper. 
Yep. We on. save money. And it was a seven to one return on investment. If you use, and this was a study that was done uh, at Northwestern, it was a seven to one uh, in, uh, savings yep. in, 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 comp- in uh, cost of, of central lines by doing it in a simulated environment. And that was taking into consideration the equipment, mm-hmm. getting people to a four hour course, having teachers for a right. four hour course. Central lines are expensive when they can become infected. Yeah. It averaged about forty to fifty thousand dollars of extra cost. Wow. Of course. To, a, to an admission, now we've been doing something about it. Yeah. So, Dr. Posner, obviously you're passionate about this. Love this. Can stuff. can we start kind of at the beginning of your career and how did you you go down this path and what was in your head? Well, it it, it was it's it's an interesting story. First of all, in EMS, which is the way I started. Right. We were doing we were doing simulation all the time. Yeah. I mean that was the way we learned. And you know we 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 had uh, a I just remember when we were doing cardiac arrest as a as a way to learn. We had an IV arm and we had a head, an intubation <laughs> head and we had a resuscitant. You know it was a five five headed uh, beast that we worked <laughs> with. Now we we've, we've consolidated it. It's now much more human. But we used to do that all the time. Mm-hmm. Now when I was at one of the hospitals that I worked at. Uh, I became the resuscitation chair of the hospital. Okay. And we, and I will say this happens in all hospitals, our performance was not the greatest. Mm-hmm. And why isn't the, the performance the greatest? Well, for many reasons. One is the most important reason is that there are unpredictable events that are low frequency, high acuity, right. that we just don't train enough for. Right. Mm-hmm. We just don't train enough for. And I was having some issues trying to sort of figure out how best to manage this common problem. So I was so frustrated at one point that I got a, I got a mannequin. I got a grant for a, a very old mannequin. This was back in the 90s. And I Annie's said- Annie's grandfather. So, so, and, I, and I said, what, how can I best leverage this situation to sort of get some attention mm-hmm. from the uh, powers that be? So you won't believe this, but I actually hired the AV squad from the hospital <laughs> and I went into the boardroom. I put the mannequin on the ground and I called, called, picked up the phone, called the operator and said, there's somebody down in the boardroom. And I said, start shooting. Oh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Posner. And uh, <laughs> I, I was either going to get fired or be a hero. Neither thing happened. <laughs> and ultimately, I had a situation that I was completely predictable where the patient did not get the best care. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, again, this is not anybody's fault. And this was happening at every hospital you can go to. But I showed it to the CEO and I said, we have a problem here. Mm -hmm. And I started doing mock codes, unannounced mock codes within the hospital. That was in 2000, I'm sorry, that was in 1999. And we did two a month at the Brigham and our performance during cardiac arrest and other emergencies improved. And how do I know that? I was giving a talk at the AHA conference in uh, in Florida about the mock code program yes. that I had set up. And a nurse came up to me and she says, you just solved a problem. I said, tell me how I solved the problem. She says, I work at the VA mm-hmm. and, I, and we have Harvard Brigham, Brigham residents and we have BU residents. And she says, when we have, when we have, when we have uh, codes with the Brigham residents, it's much more organized. And with the BU residents, it's still the, ah. the, the craziness. And I hugged her and I said, that is the, <laughs> that is music to my ears. Yeah, of course. And so it, it, it really does have an effect. And, you know, we just need to use it more. You know, and it's just, it, it even goes past, like when when I managed and I um, mm-hmm. had my nurses do mock codes, it just even knowing where the equipment was, there's just so much to the whole process. And you, you have know? to do it unannounced. Yes. Because if you announce it, everyone's ready for it. Right. There's some, some 
benefit of doing right. that. But if it's unannounced, yes. then you test the entire system. Yes. You know, you test whether the elevators work, is yep. the equipment there, do people right. know how to use the equipment, is the equipment exactly. ready to be used? Yeah. What do people know? And you can't do it in a pejorative or 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 or, or a, you know, no. what, right. you need to do it in moment. an educational way. Yeah. Right. And uh when when we started doing that, the next thing we did is we started doing team training. Because we recognize that part of the problem was the team. Mm -hmm. The teams are, you know, that we work in silos. And what we needed to do is we needed to break down the walls of the silos. So yeah. we did a lot of work with team training and improved the care the patients got. And it's not just for cardiac arrest. Anytime. You could be at home and there's an unexpected event. You're still going to use the principles that we teach, mm -hmm. right. you know, to, you know, call for help early. Yep. You know, communicate well. Put somebody in charge so somebody's watching the big picture. These are all things that we've, we've, we've learned through a variety of ways, mostly through the aviation industry, but we, mm. we have put into practice in medicine through simulation. That's great. So now going from there, running mock codes to the PC Institute, there's some other steps there. Yeah, well, I, I, I was very, very lucky. I was lucky, I was lucky in the sense... I was lucky in the sense that I had a boss at the time who was very interested in medical simulation. And I kind of knew what medical simulation was, but, you know, in a very mock code-ish way. Right. But I went out and I looked at what people were doing. And there was very little medical simulation. Yeah, I was just going to say, that was early. This was in uh, 2002. Right. And so I, I, and we, we, had, we got a grant and we were able to build a 1,500-square-foot center. Wow. And we built it. And we used it. But one of the things that we had a problem with, it wasn't right within the hospital itself. It was okay. in a building adjacent to the hospital. Yeah. And no one saw my simulation, mm. you know, equipment. So I had to figure out a way to get it in front of people. And what, what I did is I convinced my new hospital to let me do mock codes. It took me about eight months. And all of a sudden, people were interested. That's an interesting, you know, early adopter said mm -hmm. that's something that we could use. And we started using it, and the hospital said, that's a pretty cool thing. And when the surgery, the, the, the director of surgery, the chair of surgery went to the hospital and said, hey, we need to have a simulation center because the American Board of Surgery says you must have simulation as part of your curriculum. They said, go to see Chuck. Oh. And very, very lucky. They gave us $3 million. Fantastic. And instead of building it myself – because it would have been a disaster as an emergency physician building a training center mm -hmm. for surgeons and radiologists and anesthesiologists would never have been successful. So I went to all the chairs and I said, tell me, what do you know about simulation? Most people didn't know a thing about simulation. Mm -hmm. I said, this is really something that's you know, going gonna to grow. And I think we should be involved with it. But I need somebody from your department to help me build something that you'll use. Mm -hmm. And so I had I, I not everyone sent me somebody, but I had seven people from the hospital from beach from different departments, and we built a simulation center together. You're saying it like that was so easy. You said that in one sentence. There yeah. were so many moving pieces oh, to that. Many moving I'm pieces, sure. but we don't have all night. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I, I, I want to give you the the, the brief, version. Br brief version. <laughs> but we, you know, we we we. we and we built a center that other people would use. I'm not a surgeon. What they, when I go to the operating room, I'm sleeping. Okay, <laughs> I, I am not. You know, right. so I needed surgeons and anesthesiologists and obstetricians to help me build something that they would use. And then when we were done, they were invested in it. Mm -hmm. So when we started teaching residents, we had I had champions that would support the use of simulation. So what kind of simulations were they doing? Just as examples. So OB, you know, we can do deliveries. The, the simulators can actually deliver babies. Wow. And deliver babies with the with the exact twisting and, the you know, I, you I haven't delivered. You can do breach or whatnot. You can do breach. You can do, you can do nuchal cord. You can do yeah. shoulder dystocia. You can do postpartum hemorrhage. So you pop Is it into like the computer a, and it does what it needs to do. You can pop it into the computer and make nice. it do what you want it to do. That's amazing. It really is cool. Yeah. You know, I, I was very fortunate at UMass. I thought we were very progressive way back when, and we were in some ways. We had, um, which it wasn't the standard at the time, we had these actor patients that we worked with, which was really great for developing your history-taking skills and physical examination skills, and it was wonderful. You got immediate feedback. And I, I will tell you that UMass mm. has 
in this in the New England area has the best standardized patient. Well, that's what I was going to say. I went back recently for a reunion. It might have been five years ago, and I was amazed how they've completely revamped their medical education. It is nothing like what I was used to. They don't use the big classrooms anymore. They're small little kind of houses that they 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 do a lot of case studies, and then they have this amazing you know uh, simulation lab that didn't exist when I was there. It was remarkable to and, see. And interestingly, what 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 you what you're describing is what's happening in medical education. Mm -hmm. It's called the flipped classroom. And it's a, it's a it's it's ultimately in at Harvard no more lectures. Mm -hmm. They're just really? aren't lectures. My students from Brown who I have they come in 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 the office, you know, a couple times a year I'll have students for about 3 4 months at a time. They they don't sit in the classroom anymore. It amazes me. And it, it, but what when, are they doing? When we went to medical school, right. what was medical school? You sat all morning. It's a bunch of lectures. All morning, lecture after lecture after lecture right. where they fed you facts. Yep, yep. And you they sent you home to do the problems in the back of the book. And right. You'd struggle right. with the problems. Right. And then they, you'd sit down the next day and they'd give you fact after fact right. after fact. And it was just a cycle. It just kept mm -hmm. going. And what we realized was that, first of all, there are way too many facts to learn. Sure. And in this day and age... Students don't learn the way you and I used to learn. Right. Students learn by seeing and doing, and you can get the facts anywhere now. You can go to right. YouTube and get the facts. And so now what they do is they say, go get the facts. They don't just say, say go to YouTube. They, you know, they have right, different right. ways, different, right. different modalities to serve the facts up. They say, you go learn the facts, and now you come into the, in, into the class with a professor or you know, a teacher and we'll go through the problems and you'll integrate those facts yeah. into the care of patients. There is just way too much to know. Facts are not the issue. It's how do you use the right. facts? Because if you need issue. to know about the Krebs cycle, you can look up the Krebs cycle. And you spend so much time learning things such as that. Everything you need to take care of patients <laughs> is right here. <laughs> That's true. You know, not the, not the, the cognitive part of it right. is here. The, the 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 art of medicine and yeah. the and the you know the the te technique of medicine is something that's a learned mm -hmm. process. But you can't know it all. They right. say they say that in I just I, I read I read that the um, the doubling of medical educate of medical facts mm. in 1950 was 50 years. In 2020, it was 73 days. Mm. How the heck can you remember it all? Yeah, you, it's it's impossible. Really, it's impossible. I was talking to Nancy about this. Whenever we have specialists on the show, we we learn things every time. We really do. You know, um, even though we we both try to stay very, very current, you still learn because uh, there's too much out there to know everything about every field. So the way I got into PCI was I built a simulation center and we, because we were at Harvard, you know, people wanted to know what we were doing. And I was invited to help build simulation centers, as I said, all over the world. Like mm. my first one was in India. We built one in Kazakhstan. I built one in China. And through that, I learned how to sort of work in different cultures and different institutions to build a simulation center that they'll use. Because if I built my simulation center in China, it would never be used. I mean, it's just a different set of politics mm -hmm. and culture and finances. So you got it. But I got a reputation. And when the group here decided to uh, build a simulation center as part of the PC, PC Institute, they got a hold of me. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd love to help. And I came in as a, as a uh, consultant yeah. and we started building it and we were totally, in, you know, everything got delayed by COVID. It was really a problem. And then when I decided I was going to sort of begin my, you know, glide s slope into retirement, I came on, you know, sort of as a part-time chief medical officer. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing now. And I am Great. just enjoying it. It's It's been really a good, good, good go. And uh, we built a very, very nice center. Uh, it's really, it's really remarkable. I mean, it's, it's hard to believe that it's in southeastern Massachusetts, quite and, honestly. And uh, it's, it, it's very impressive. The best way for us to sell it is to show it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And when people come here, they're in awe of, of what capabilities we have. Absolutely. And I will say, and, I, and this I want to make sure people understand this, the, the physical plant and the equipment is important, but not nearly as important as the teachers and the curriculum. 
Mm -hmm. right. And that's one of the things that we're really pushing is how do you develop curriculum that will allow people to learn and not just trainees, but attending physicians. Right. And you know what's really cool? Because of your, your, your very much in-depth experience building all these all around the world, like when you came here to do it, like all that knowledge went into this. So, I mean, talk about cutting edge. But it's but everywhere you go, it's different. Yeah. I mean, there there again. If I try to do what I think it yeah. should be done based on my experience, you know, in Boston, I'll fail. Mm -hmm. I need to. You know, the first thing I did is I did a needs assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What What is that? What's the marketplace look like? Right. What are their needs? Right. And how do I meet their needs? And then you build it based on what you think is going to work. I, I don't. I, <laughs> it kind of sounds like Field of Dreams. But, it, well, I, it's, not, it's not as easy as that. Building it is easy. Right. That's the easiest part of a simulation center is building it. And people think once you build it, they will come. That is absolutely not the case. You need to know that there's people out there that, that will adopt the use of medical simulation. Mm -hmm. And you've got to show them what, how it can be valuable to them. Is you've that got to challenging solve the still today? Very even like Even though it's like obviously the way to go? Change management is the problem with everything in medicine. You know, getting people to move from what they've done for years and years and years is always difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some people that are early adopters that you can quickly change. There are some people that you will never change. And what you need to do is use those early adopters to start using it and then chip away at those people that are not completely against this stuff, but need to be convinced that it's going right. to be. Even from a financial perspective, though, the ROI, like just decreasing the costs with. I will say you're absolutely right. And I think one of the problems we've had in simulation is that we've not looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. We're just beginning to look at it because who makes the decisions in hospitals? It's not doctors anymore. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the CFOs. Right. You know, and we don't speak the language of the CFOs. We speak the language of the patient safety people, but they're struggling to get, you know, supported. So one of the things we've done is we've begun to say, what is the tangible and intangible right. return on investment so that we can go to the CEO and CFO and say, this is right. what you can get from it. Of now, they also want to take very good care of patients, yep. but there is a there is a limited amount of money for any right. institution. Right. And if you spend it here, you don't have to spend there. So they have difficult decisions to make. So it's on us to make sure that we give them the information to allow them to make the decision that will support mm -hmm. simulation. So Dr. Posner, what are you doing here at the PC Institute? What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I'm doing a variety of things. First of all, I, d I designed the, the physical plant itself. Right. I chose the mannequins and the s skills trainers that we are gonna use. We're not buying things that we think we're gonna use. Okay. And that's one of the issues that people, you know, in many simulation centers do. They have aspirations of how this will work. What we've decided is we're going to buy things that we know we're going to use. And then when we develop courses that require different things, we'll bring them in. Makes sense. We have, we have a, uh, we just signed an agreement with Salve Regina for the nice. nursing school. Yes. That's great. And they want to have some OB obstetrical of simulation. Course. I don't have an obstetrical simulator here, but there are great ones out there. So now I'm looking for an obstetrical simulator to bring in. Now, if I brought it in two years ago, there's a better one now. Right. So why don't you Very get smart. it now? Why don't you get it when you need it? And now you get a better one. And right. what people do is they buy all this stuff, spend all this money, and they dust it off when they mm -hmm. finally need it. Right. And it's an old, it's an old machine. Right. The technology changes. Of course. Yeah, it's like our cell phones. Every right. few years, are outdated. Our computers, things Who change develops? so quickly. <laughs> Who develops the curriculum? That's pretty amazing. You can get you can get standardized curriculum, of course. And you know, from a, from an efficiency point of view, it is. Uh, it is, it's, it's a reasonable way to do it. Yeah. I am from the old school uh, that curriculum is number one. Of course. Mm -hmm. And I think for an individual 
educational program, there are nuances to what you can teach that will be specific for that program. For instance, when I, when I develop a curriculum, and what, what I try to do is I don't develop the curriculum. I mentor the instructors in how to build a curriculum because I want them to learn how to build a curriculum. I can't build everyone's curriculum, but I can train people to build curriculum. And what we do, most people say, I need to do a, a scenario on acute pulmonary edema. And everyone knows what acute pulmonary edema is, but what this group needs versus what that group needs, it might be completely different. If I'm teaching a, 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 a group of attendings, that scenario has mm-hmm. to be specific to them. If I'm teaching a group of medical students, right. it's gotta be specific to right. them. So the first thing you do is you say, what is the knowledge gap? What do these learners need to learn? Right. And once you identify the knowledge gaps, then you, then you develop objectives that if they meet those objectives, you will close those gaps. And then once you know what objectives they need to meet, now you build your scenario. It's like multi-level learning. Mm. Oh, it's, 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 it, it is so much fun and it is so beneficial because every time you come into this, this simulation center, we will get you to those branch points that will engage you so you will learn. In the learning, generally, unless you're doing skills education, the learning doesn't happen during the, during the scenario. The learning happens afterwards when you discuss them. What, what we use the scenario for is to engage them. Hmm. Oh, so then you do like a, almost like a debriefing afterwards. And it's all about debriefing. Oh, and you do it in a ingenious. psychologically safe way. Yeah. Because this can be quite emotional for people. Right. And you need to do it in a way that ultimately gets the most learning from the investment of time and energy of doing it. And it is it, it, it really, I, I, I've become a real advocate of this. And, you know, it's not everything. I still think there are many other ways that we need to t- train clinicians. But it has to be a, 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 a factor within medical education because adults learn by doing. Yes. Adults are active learners. And what we try to do is if we give, if we give you a scenario mm-hmm. – and we, you know, we, 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 you know, how do people come into a lecture? I'm gonna, this is an analogy I always use. When you go to a lecture, you come in with a knowledge. And there's perceived knowledge mm-hmm. and there's mm-hmm. actual knowledge. Right. <laughs> okay. Sometimes they're flipped. Sometimes you know more than you think you know. Mm-hmm. But generally it's this way. Right. right. You know, you think you know more than you actually know. Right. When you come into a simulation, The same exact thing. You know what you know. Now we put you through a simulation and you will perform exactly the way you would perform using your actual knowledge. We haven't taught you anything. Mm -hmm. But look what happens to perceived knowledge. Mm -hmm. And now we've closed that knowledge, you know, that gap. And now that's the engaged student. They recognize that they don't know everything. Mm, so you close the gap between perception and reality. Well, it's motivational, too. Yeah. And it's totally motivational. It's an engagement tool. Right. And then we know it. We, 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 we put them into a position to learn what they needed to learn because we knew what they needed to learn and predicted that and built the simulation so that they would learn that. And now we can have a very, very good discussion. So, and it's all it's, non-threatening. All psychologically right. safe. So it's, it's a lot safer for patients, obviously. And it's a lot safer and it's for a lot, students. And it's safer for students, and and they they get to learn on uh, in 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 a safe manner rather than being kind of thrown out in the hospital to you know kind of the old like you said see one do one do teach one teach one, one which uh, was always so very anxiety provoking very anxiety provoking and you want to have a level of anxiety yeah when you're learning but you don't want to give somebody PTSD right right. Yeah, and in the old days, in the old days, the old days, um, you know, like you'd get signed, you'd have your little card, and then someone would sign you off three times right. on a certain skill. But you know, if yeah. they were like rushed, oh, yeah, I'll trust. I mean, you. I remember the most no. ex- anxiety-provoking rotation was the night float. Oh yeah, because you were like you were an intern, and you were the person in the hospital. You really didn't know a lot, and and you were responsible for a lot. 
and you had backup, but still, you know, it was very scary. We we didn't have attendings in the emergency department. Yeah. You you know, you were a third year resident, and it was your baby. Yeah, that that's crazy. I mean, when we did our ICU rotations, it was probably pretty similar. There was always an attending that was available at night by phone, um, but we were there. The resident was there, the intern was there, and, and we we were there. So and you was, want you, know, you want to give trainees a graded experience. Right. You want to give them more and more responsibility. And that, you know, the ACGME and all these, you know, these folks uh, that are developing these curricula are very interested in giving a mm. graded sort of respons- responsibility uh, in training. But you can't, you, you got to keep the patient at the center of the target. Absolutely. You got to keep the patient at the center of the right. target. And that's not patient centric. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, ultimately, you want to train your people and you want to give them graded responsibility, but you want to do that in as safe a manner as possible. Right. And again, I think you were right, Chris. It's not only safe for the patient, but it's safe for the trainee as well. Right. And much more learning goes on. I mean, there is something to be said about learning how to deal with stress in real life situations Absolutely. and that, and, and that's part of it. And But still, you want to do it in a manner that's safe for everyone. And you will learn those things. Mm -hmm. I can't give you every permutation of what goes on. But what I can do is I can make it a little less problematic when something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And, and, And I think that we owe that to our trainees. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about, you know, the perfect medical education. And if I were to create a medical school, how I would do it. And I think it would be a hybrid of what I did at UMass and and what you're doing. I mean, I still love the fact that we had actor patients and we really honed in on our our history taking skills and our physical exam technique. And and some of that I'm sure you can you can do to some extent, the physical exam technique at least with the simulation. But but that whole personal interaction was important. But on the other hand, I love this whole aspect of it. And not being on the wards and learning this stuff from someone who maybe has a year more experience than you that may be good at it and may not be good at it, depends on the luck of the draw, and having to deal with all of that darn anxiety that we dealt with. And we're, we're also not only not just using mannequins, we're using mm-hmm. standardized patients. Yeah, that's great. Because it, it, I'm, I, I'm so going to ask you. That's perfect. To me, that's perfect. I'm going to ask you, mm. how did you learn how to tell a family member that their loved one passed away? Mm. You the, learn by doing. Yeah, there was, I mean, I think we learned that we had some of those scenarios with the actor patients. There was certainly some observation from attendings and those that were more experienced. But ultimately, when it came down to what I developed as a style and practice, a lot of it was you do it on your own. Absolutely. And, and now we can do it in a simulated environment with real actors, people that can actually, yeah. you know, perform as if that's a real family member. Right. And one of, one of my favorite programs that we we developed uh, at, at, at the Brigham was a neurology with the Department of Neurology. And, you know, pronouncing somebody brain dead is a very difficult mm-hmm. and, and, and complicated way to do it. And you need to learn how to do that. And we, we, we developed a scenario in which we could go through the steps and teach That's people right. how, to, how to do that. Mm-hmm. But we didn't stop there. The, the, the next part of it was you needed to go in and speak to the family mm-hmm. about this situation. So not only do you need to learn the technical stuff, you also needed to learn the non-technical stuff, right. which is just as important. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to have that balance of both. Absolutely. Yeah. So then ultimately, you're doing competency assessments too, and then whose responsibility is that? So- it, it depends. Many people don't want to do competency okay. assessments. It's a, it's a controversy within simulation. Should oh. you be using a safe environment to do summative evaluation? We, we usually do formative evaluation. Okay. Okay, where you're using the evaluation not as a grading tool, yeah. but as a teaching tool. Okay. And now you're taking that environment and you're doing summative evaluation. You're sort of mixing things. And yeah, there's a, there's a, and all of a sudden a, it doesn't feel so safe anymore. So you've got to – and I'm, I'm, of the, I'm of the mind that you just need to separate it. You need yeah. to make sure that, that if sense. you're using it for summative evaluation, you are absolutely clear 
that that's what's here. Okay. We, when we do, when we talk about the safe environment, we do a pre-briefing for our, our participants. And the pre-briefing is three components. The first is the basic assumption. And we sit there with the, with the, the group, and this takes about mm. five to seven minutes, and we say, listen, everyone comes to work and everyone comes to this program to do the best darn job they can. Every, no one comes to work to fail. No one comes to work to make mistakes. But we also know that we're human beings. And human beings make mistakes. That is sure. just part of the human condition. Of course. You will make mistakes here. There's no okay. question. I would make mistakes here if I was mm -hmm. in this situation not knowing what was going on. Right. But what a phenomenal place to make mistakes. I'd rather make a mistake on a mannequin than <laughs> You'd much prefer to make a mistake <laughs> on a living breathing here human being <laughs> than making a mistake on a, on a on a on a real patient. So absolutely you will make mistakes. Yeah. Not a problem. This is a great place to make mistakes. I mean, it's a kind of a bit of a crazy assumption that you know, medical students and residents will never make mistakes. It, it's it's impossible. It's one. It's in uh, it's, it's part of human nature. So make the mistakes in a place where it's not going to hurt anyone. Ask me a question about team training. It's yeah. one of my favorite things. But I want to finish this. Sure. The next thing is we call it the fiction contract. We say to them, "This is not real. Mm -hmm. This is a simulated environment. This isn't where you work. These aren't necessarily the people you normally work with." But we know that if you treat this as, nor as, as, as usually as you can, as if it's as normal as your environment, you will get the most out of it. And we will make it as, as, as real as we possibly can, understanding that it's not real. Mm. But everything that we do here could happen. We don't do anything that is out of the realm of possibility. Right. Right. Somebody could have a, a, a situation in the cafeteria. You're not going to have all your equipment. Right. right. Okay. So it, it might not be the normal setting, but these are all plausible scenarios. Mm -hmm. And just treat it as if it's real as you can. We'll go halfway. You go halfway with us. And the last thing is, if it's not a summative evaluation, yeah. it's not a grading situation, right. we say what happens here stays here. We're like Vegas. Yeah, that's great. OK, we don't want you to talk about us because we don't want everyone to know all of our scenarios and we don't want you to talk about each other and we won't talk about you mm -hmm. it's because we want people to reflect on their prior experiences to figure out why they did the things that they did. Because usually it's not just a reflex. Usually it's something that happened before that they either they misunderstood or they were put in a situation that was made them think of it differently. Mm. And that's one of the jobs of the debriefer is to sort of nice. think about it from a, not a fix this problem, but fix what caused this problem. And I think it's a really important uh, mm. feature of simulation. So suppose you talked about creating curriculum, but suppose an organization just wants to do some standardized stuff. Do you have that's not a problem? That's not a problem. There are many, many standardized curriculum. Many of the simulation mannequin companies are now have a library of curriculum. Oh. And, and again, it, it's, it's my way of thinking about it. And, and it's probably not the most efficient way, but I think <laughs> it's the most uh, useful way. Mm. Now, who, like, what types of groups use uh, an institution, an institute like this? So you talked about the nursing from Salve Regina. A variety of places. We do, we, we do programs for nursing students. We do programs for early career nurses. Oh. Okay, that are coming out. You know, mm. COVID had a real devastating effect on the training right. of, 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 of folks. Of course. And when, when, when uh, St. Anne's came to us and said, you know, we'd like to do something in your simulation center. We actually, the first thing I said is, what would you like to do? Mm -hmm. And they weren't sure what they wanted to do. I said, okay, let's think of it this way. <laughs> what keeps you up at night? Oh, great question. What keeps you up at night as a nursing administrator? What, you know, of these early career nurses who right. are dedicated, who are as well-trained as they can be given the circumstances of, of, of what happened during COVID, what are the things that you think they would most benefit from? And together we decided what to do. And we've run this program several times. We're gonna do it again in, in, in a couple of weeks. And it has been so successful. 
I, of course. I mean, you know, here are kids that have an innate desire to mm -hmm. heal, to help. And, you know, you're just supplementing that in such a beautiful mm -hmm. way. It's, it, is, mm -hmm. it is about helping people. It's facilitating yes. learning. It's yep. not, you know, teaching them. Right. It's facilitating a, 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 a way to learn in a durable manner. Because mm -hmm. if you learn it experientially, it's a much more durable way of, of, of teaching. Now, I hear that you have cadavers here. Shh. <laughs> Shh. What do you do with them? So that's a very – now, I'm not a, I'm not a bioskills person. As a okay. matter of fact, before I came here, I didn't even know what bioskills was. Mm. Okay. But it's a, it is a use – it's a very reasonable use of donated human tissue yeah. to teach people how to take care of patients. Now, in this setting – we usually do it for surgeons, mm -hmm. oh. okay? So if there's a new technique for replacing a shoulder, just like you wouldn't want to learn that in the real operating room, right. well, now we can use donated cadavers and teach the That's surgeons great. how to use that new equipment. That's great. So when they go into the operating room, they've already done it. That's amazing. It, it really is. It, it, really it just is. makes sense. It just, you know we're 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 you know we're we're slowly figuring all this out. I, re I remember when I was doing my surgical rotations, as we all do as medical students. You know, they teach us how to um, do suturing on an orange, but I guess that only takes you so far. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you need to learn how to tie knots. Right. <laughs> you need, you know, there's there. It's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, one the, one of the reasons why we were able to expand at the Brigham is because the American Board of Surgery said you must use. Uh, you must pass this test called the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery before you can sit for your boards. Mm. And it's using a very basic box. We had to tie knots and use different instruments and mm. show that you had manual dexterity because when you're doing it laparoscopically with these instruments, you're working in – you live in a three-dimensional world. You're working in a two-dimensional world. So the hand-eye coordination needs – it's a learned process. Sure. But one of the things that really just – I just don't understand, and I, I understand it. I, I know there are logistical issues, but why are they waiting until the fifth year right. to make sure that they pass this test? Right. Sure, sure. They should be passing this test before they go in yeah. the OR. Right. Now, I know that that means we have to change the way we do things because you need people right. in the OR to sort of support the mm -hmm. OR. But if you had thought about it reasonably – before they went into the OR, they should learn these basic techniques so that when they go to the OR with the attending surgeon, they're mastering it mm -hmm. as opposed to learning it. And I will tell you that OR nurses will be happier because it takes sure. less time. Surgeons would be happier because it less, takes less time. And patients would be safer. Yep. So... With new procedures that are coming out, you can do the learning curve here too as as well. Absolutely. Right? So it's not like just by chance if you happen to come across it in your practice, it's like you get a leg up. Another way we, we've used it, uh, there are several ways we use it, but one way we've used it is with uh, industry. Okay. Okay, so I'll give you an example. A, a company has a new defibrillator. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and they, you know, how did they, how did they use, usually, uh, you know, design these? Well, they had an engineer design them. They had a user interface person design, design it. And they would sit in, on a table in front of a bunch of different <laughs> clinicians. And they'd say, what do you think of this? And they'd say, oh, I think that button should go there and that dial should go here right. and maybe you should do it this way. Well, what, what, what we've done now is we said, why don't you bring your prototype and we'll develop scenarios in which real clinicians oh, that's great. will use it. Yes. And now your user interface and, 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 and uh, you know, engineers – will be able to watch it and then ask them questions yeah, right. see how see you know you can get a much more mature product 
And you can stream the, those conversations, so you can get everyone. You can you can stream them, but what a what an opportunity to oh, make yeah. your make your make prototype more mature before yep. it goes into the clinical right. trials. Right. So that's another way we can Amazing. use simulation. It really is. I'm it so is glad you guys cool. are yeah. here. Yeah. It is. It is. It is pretty cool. And the last thing, and I, 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 I'm going to remind you to talk about team training. Yes. I think that personally, I think that is the the the, the, the even more important than any drug, mm-hmm. any device, any procedure that we could define. And I'm being a little bit hyperbolic here. Why? Because we have about four hundred thousand avoidable medical errors Mm -hmm. that occur every year. And we could argue that number, but even if it was 100,000, which was the uh, the original calculation back in the uh, late 90s, we got to do something about that. You know, and why do mistakes happen? For a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to ever, we're never going to eliminate all mistakes. Right. But we need to do something. Right. And one of the reasons that we have mistakes is poor communication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you look at malpra- closed case malpractice suits, poor communication has a component of that in about 70% of them. I believe it. In about 70% of them. And, and some of those are just, you know, not reading something. But if you talk about clinical mistakes that are for from poor communication, we got to do something about that. Mm-hmm. And team training, we, we, we developed this through the aviation industry because the aviation industry right. is the safest industry in the world. Six Sigma. Okay. Yeah. And, and part of that is that they go to simulation once every six to nine months. So they are crashing an airplane. When Sully Sullenberger Hmm. You know, flew that, you know, landed that plane in the Hudson. He had never done that before. Right. But I can almost guarantee you he had he had dealt with several catastrophic, catastrophic engine failures in a simulator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. We need to adopt that as well. Yeah. But getting back to it is there's got to be good communication. And why don't people communicate well? And I think it's all about ego. You're probably right. Check your ego at the door. Yeah, and a lot of us work in silos to some extent, too. Absolutely. But, I mean, surgeons have really adopted this. Absolutely. You know? I mean, they've done a great job trying to prevent, you know, wrong side surgeries and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, that's all about communication right. and following specific protocols, which basically is aligned with what the airline industry, as you mentioned, does. I'm very so proud of So how do you what... address that here, though? Here? I need to get people to come and do these programs. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, my, my, my motto is... The answer's almost always in the room. It just doesn't always get to the patient. Mm. That's part of the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, I'm the attending physician. I don't want to look dumb in front of these people. Right. And you're the nurse. He's not going to listen to me. Or I got yelled at the last time. I, I, I opened my mouth. I'm not going. I'm not going to do that. I just don't and that's like where mistakes you. happen. And that's where mistakes happen. If I give a group of people a test on something that they they do, you know, reasonably often, there'll be a variety of scores. Some people do well, some people won't do so well. Right. But if I give them one test to do together, I can almost guarantee they get 100%. The answer's almost always in the room. Hmm. It just doesn't always get to the patient. We need to level the hierarchies. And keep the patient at the center of the, tar- mm-hmm. center of the target. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about him or her. Yeah. Right. And these are the types sure. of things that we're teaching so that people can communicate in a much more effective way. And we're a lot smarter together than we are individually. No question about it. No question And some of those it. skills must come out in the debriefing. That's they exactly have that where they come out. That's mm-hmm. where they come out. Yeah. And we, we have team training. To not talk about the technical things, right. but to talk about the non-technical things. That's great. Because they are the, the underpinning support structure for all that technical stuff. And right. you need both of them. Right. Mm. There's so much that comes out in communication, informal and formal True. communication. That's great. So 
I think when we air this podcast, we will attach a, a virtual tour to it. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And just so people can really get a sense of what the area is and what's available. Um, and, and, and again, you know, use your imagination. <laughs> We've not thought of everything to do with simulation. So if you've got a great idea, mm. we're willing to vet it. How do they contact you if they're interested in doing a simulation or they can, if they want They can call me. They can, you know, go to our website. Okay. Uh, they can, uh, you know, write me an email. I mean, so what it, we can list the contact information, yeah. but um, we can get that out later. But sure. is there is there a particular number that you have on the top of your head they should call if they want information about the the institute? Uh, you can call the institute's number, and I can never remember. That's okay. We'll, never, we'll get it. We'll get never, it. Ever call nice it, or they can even call my cell phone. <laughs> that's all right. right we'll perfect. get it out there. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. There. No, that's all right. right. That's right. <laughs> Tyler hey, will put that in the show notes. If 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 you never I knew everything, I'd be that's perfect. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, is there as we come to a close here? Is there one story you can tell us about how simulation-based learning really made a difference for for someone or for a group? I think the, what I what I talked to you earlier about the mock codes, yes. I think is one of the most uh, rewarding yeah. mm. stories yes. that it clearly made a difference. And not only did it, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, doing studies, but this was real life. Right. And you were talking about the checklists and things like that. Mm -hmm. We actually did the checklist studies at my simulation lab. Atul Gawande, who's a friend, I was, I was on his crisis checklist paper in the New England Journal. Why? Okay. Because you couldn't do the study anywhere else. <laughs> and we developed the checklists. You know, Atul is brilliant. I mean, he is just so, do you, do you know Atul? I do not know. Atul Gawande wrote the checklist manifesto. He wrote uh, better. He wrote, he's a writer for the New Yorker, and he's okay. an endo endocrine surgeon okay. at the Brigham. And he's just a brilliant guy. I think he's working in the White House now. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, he said, you know, he was the one who developed the surgical safety checklist, the one okay. that's routine. The timeouts. Okay, he was the leader of that 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 process. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he says, wait, if you can save lives and decrease morbidity. Mm -hmm. with routine checklists, well, what can we do with crisis checklists? And again, he looked at the aviation industry because mm -hmm. when Sully Sullenberger was flying that plane into the, landing that plane into the, uh, into the Hudson River, what do you think his co-pilot was doing? Closing his eyes and praying real hard. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> he, he had lifted up and got the catastrophic engine failure. Yep. Checklist. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Did again, you do it's all this? About communication. Do, did you do this? And if you didn't do it, do it. Right. That's what they did. And he says, well, if the aviation industry is the safest industry in the in in in, in existence, right. and maybe I'm wrong, but they're a pretty darn safe industry. Sure. Yeah. Then why aren't we using these? Right. And so we developed, the, you know, we looked at the the uh we ended up with 12 most common uh, in, in, in interoperative emergencies. Mm -hmm. And we went to the guidelines and the books and we said, well, how do, you, how do you manage these? And then we went and took them to experts in the field mm -hmm. and says, is this, how would you change these? Mm -hmm. And then we were going to make our own, you know, uh, checklists. But Atul said, no, no, no. He says, we're going to hire the chief of uh, safety at Boeing. Oh. Because they know how to make checklists. Okay. I guess and, so. And so we, we, we made them as they, they do them in, the, in, in aviation. That's genius. Which is not, not all these algorithms. You, you've right. seen all the algorithms right. where they go this Three direction, pages. that yeah, direction, yeah. this yeah, direction. Yeah. But did you do this? Did you do this? Right. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And if you needed extra information, it was over here. That's What's great. the dose of epinephrine? You don't need it here. No. You need you need something that's easy to figure out. And we studied it. Hmm. Three we had we had 17 surgical teams came into the simulation lab, used our OR, 
and we gave them six cases, three with, three without the checklist. And we gave them an introduction to the checklist mm-hmm. and yeah. how to use them. Yeah. And we randomized it. And we had blinded uh, uh, evaluators yeah. look, you know, people that didn't know any of these right. people. And, you know, and you couldn't absolutely say that whether or not, not they were using checklists or not. Right, but they, right. they, we tried to do it as, as, as unbiased, in an as unbiased way as possible. They were 78% better. Mm-hmm. Really? With the check. How yeah. significant? That's pretty remarkable. Oh, that was totally significant. Yeah. And one of the questions we asked is, would you want a family member or yourself to go to the operating room without a checklist? And they, 98% of them says, we oh, need yeah. these checklists. And now they're in many, many, sure. in many, many operating rooms, you yeah. know, so that. You don't, you don't have to just remember everything because you won't. You can't remember it all. You can't remember it all. It's mm-hmm. and it's not a it's not a failing of the of a human. It's right. called right. being a human. Right. And we need to have a, we need to have ways right. of doing that. And that's one of the research projects we've done as well. We've that's been doing great. stuff with NASA. That's awesome. You know, that's with their incredible. Mars mission. That's great. That's excellent. Oh, this has been great. What a great conversation. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed it Thank as well. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I, you know, I love the facility. I've learned a lot. It's been wonderful. Well, we love it, and we want to use it as often as we can, because what a waste if we didn't use sure. it. Sure. Yes, well, well, thank you for your wonderful work, and thanks for being on here with our for our podcast. We appreciate it greatly. So I want to, at this time, um, thank Bay Coast Bank, which is just right for all of your financial needs. Visit baycoast.bank or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. Thank you, everyone, for watching The 27th Degree with Chris and Nancy and Dr. Posner. Thank you so much again for for joining in and and, and providing this really great information. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.